görüyoruz. Shalom and welcome, you guys. 
to today's class, and I want to apologize first for having to delay this class till Sunday uh, with the unprecedented solar activity. It was no way to know what was going to happen, and I didn't want to have you guys online um, when all that was going on, and simultaneously when that was happening, uh, we were under a severe thunderstorm warning here. Sorry, I have a little dog just trying to get me his attention. And uh, it's been raining for three days nonstop it, uh, with some local flooding and wind and things like that. So it was kind of a chaotic time. Anyway, uh, here we are today. Hope everyone's well. No one had any issues. And maybe you got to see the, the auroras <laughs> um, that happened. Uh, amazing event that, that just took place. Uh, so here we are back again, uh, once again in class. Uh, if you would, you guys, let's jump right into, uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into vocabulary, and then I got a little presentation for you on our very search topic that we're going to uh, use as an exercise, uh, and so I think you will enjoy that, and then right after that, we'll get into any of the download issues and things like that and um, cover that, all right? So let me just open up with prayer. Abba Yehu, we're just so thankful, Father, for this opportunity once again to gather in your name on this day. And we just thank you for this. And we ask that you dwell with us here today, Father, that you would help us to understand and uh, that you would open our hearts and our minds to uh, what you have, that you would keep us sealed in your mighty name, Father, that you keep us protected from the enemy with your holy angels. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, you guys, let's get right into the vocabulary for today and get that behind us. And then we're going to talk about a very special topic. Um, one of the very first search exercises that I'm going to have you guys do, even though not all of you have your code programs, I kind of want to keep you engaged and inspired in some of the things that we're going to do. We're going to talk about one of the very first search topics that I, that I ever encountered. And it's very special to me. And uh, I think it's one of the probably um, one of the most important topics of the Bible, and that's Yeshua codes, right? And that's what kind of plays along into that is Yeshua codes. And that is that topic is the Shroud of Turin, uh, or otherwise known as the burial cloth of Yeshua. So we're going to be talking about that for a few minutes today. But first, let's get right into your vocabulary. We've got, uh, I think, 10 or 11 vocabulary for today. And... Um, your very first word for today is the word for stone. Stone. Three letters. And that word is Evan. And that's an Aleph, a Bet, and a Noon. Evan. I don't know why Google's got it as Stein. <laughs> but as you can see there, it also means stone. Again, Google can be kind of iffy sometimes um, with some of the the interpretations of what the words say. Aleph, bet, final noon, means stone, evan. Very next word is oyav. Oyav is an enemy, and that is also three letters. It's an aleph, yod, bet. You know what? I see what's happening now. It's not giving us the uh, translation in English. We want that. It's giving it in German for some reason. <laughs> what is going on here? Just one moment, you guys. We want to see that in, in English. <laughs> I can't believe I was doing that in German. That word is ayav, oyav. It means enemy, but as you can also see, well, it's a mistranslation there. Again, Google is not such a great translator. Very next word is barit, which means covenant, and that is a bet resh yod tav. Covenant or alliance. Bet resh yov tav is the word. The for, for instance, the berit hadasha is the New Testament, right? So this would be berit 
the new covenant. Bashar is our next word. Three letters. Bet, shin, resh. Bashar. And that means meat or flesh. You'll see this over and over again, especially in um, the Torah when they're when it's talking over and over again about the sacrifices. Um, uh, incidentally, these sacrifices weren't just thrown away. Okay, so all this meat that they're sacrificing is being prepared as a meal for the people. Okay, so you'll see that and, and realize what's going on. This wasn't just about blood thirst and spilling blood of innocent animals. The animals were actually consumed, uh, especially during Passover when um, when all that was going on. I think at the time of Yeshua, 250,000 lambs were sacrificed and prepared as a meal for the people, right? Bashar, meat, bet, resh, yeah. bet, shin, resh. Go ahead. Hey, Jonathan. Um, yeah. My, the biggest trouble I have is when, you know, we, we have like a word in Hebrew, right? And And so I can't see on the screen the Hebrew alphabet, but sometimes matching what is my result to the keyboard isn't always very obvious. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I don't know if anybody else has that trouble, but like matching Hebrew words with the keyboard, because sometimes it has little squiggly things here and there. And yeah. So, so your problem. font is your font may be a little different. And so um, you see and you'll you'll learn this as you go, the different fonts. Yeah. This one on Google here is very basic, but in some of the other translators, you'll see them with, with the coup, some of the dots and tittles and stuff, because it's uh, it, it's concerned about pronunciation. Um, for the most part, right. the, the code program doesn't care how you pronounce these words. They right. just need the <laughs> sequence of letters to be correct. So um and that's something we got to be careful of in some of the initial searches you guys have is misspelled words. And so that's why we're going to do exercises together, like the one yeah. I'm going to show you today. So uh, I'm going to be giving you the the access term um, and, and you'll be typing those in. If you can't, if you aren't able to find it or it does not have a result, that means you misspelled it. So this will be right. a good learning opportunity for you guys to hit these keys right. Um you guys need to know these letters. Each one of these twenty-two letters, their their final, um, you know, uh, presentation as well, like nuns and mems and things like that in their final form. Um, you kind of need to know those to be able to type out these letters correctly, or otherwise you you will not get the results that we're looking for. Okay, so misspelling is the number one thing that we're going to avoid. And so any of the any issues that come up, I can't find this, I can't find that, and I typed it in exactly. We're going to go back and look at it and see where you made that mistake. Because like I said early in this in this class, some of these letters look very similar. And one of the most frequent mistakes made is misspelling because you used the wrong letter. For instance, this letter here looks very similar to this letter. This is the resh and the dalin. Okay. And if you're not careful, you might think this is a resh right here because it looks very similar to the resh. Other, other, other than it has a little tail on the end. I know the, I know the font here is very small, but a dollar has a little tail on the end, and a resh is rounded. So this is one of those letters that are most frequently um, misunderstood, and, and you know mistakes are made. Uh, another way is a hey, which has a little opening on one side, and the het, which is completely sealed all the way around, has a rounded edge as well as as the hay, but it has, it's sealed. There's, there's no little opening there. These letters are often confused for one another. So that's, you know, that's something to look for. The, the, the noon and the bob, which are right next to each other. They're basically one line and another line that's a little bit longer, right? But if you're not, if you're not thinking and, and or, you know, have a misunderstanding, got them flipped around and stuff, you may think this is a bob and that's a noon. Right. And so you, therefore you misspell the word. Right. So um, we're going to cross those bridges when we get to it. And and it's expected that you guys will misspell words and uh, we're going to work through that. So so no worry. So um, just keep that in mind. And sometimes some of these words have different meanings because they're synonyms. 
And so you'll see that kind of, you know, as a matter of fact, one of our words today is a synonym. Um, it has two different meanings, you know, depending on the context. Anyway, keeping forward, um, the next word is gavul. Now, gavul means boundary or a border. And that is a gimel, a bet, a bob and a lamed, a bob and a lamed, gavul. Google has it as limit, but it also means boundary or border. Gavul. Gimel, bet, bob, lamed. This next one is Here's the synonym right here. It's called Hodesh. And that is a He, excuse me, a Chet, a Dalit, and a Shin, Hodesh. Now, Hodesh is kind of um, interesting because if, um, if you guys have done any studying on the calendar, you may have seen this topic over and over again where they say, oh, that, this does not mean new moon. It means month. Uh, no, it means both. And, and they get this argument because they go into um, – Google Translate and put in new moon, and guess what they get? They get something completely different. Yerach Hodesh. Yerach Hodesh with Yerach moon on the beginning of it. But in biblical Hebrew, and in even in modern Hebrew today, this is a synonym. It is understood that Hodesh, Hodesh, as a word means new in the context of a moon or a month it's also true Chodesh means new moon and new month it's a synonym so sometimes you know like if you wanted to see what new moon is and you go and put it in it you see that it says Yerach Chodesh you won't see Yerach Chodesh in the text talking about a new moon or a new moon month it will always be Chodesh or Rosh Chodesh, which means the, the new, the head of the month um, uh, would be the word there. So it's a synonym. It has two meanings depending on the context used. Chodesh, Chet Dalad Shin is the word. The next word is Hayav, and that is a Chet Yod Lamed. Chet Yod Lamed means strength, force, wealth, or an army. Chayal. Chet Yod Lamed is the word. Hased. Hased is Chet Samak Dalad. This is the word that you will see in the English that's translated as grace. But it also means loyalty and faithfulness. Sometimes you'll see uh, where it's used as forgiveness. It's a chet samak dalad is the word. Grace, kindness, charity. The very next one is only two letters, and it means hand or power, and that is yod. That's a yod, dalad. That means hand. You'll you'll often see this where you'll see where the text says that he led them out of Egypt with an arm, uh, outstretched hand, and it means power and and um, you know uh, uh, authority. There's another word, yod. Yod Dalad. Next word is Midbar. And that is a Mem Dalad Bet Resh. Midbar. A couple of ways to use this. In one way, it could be used as, as speak um, because of the bar that's in there. That's the root word. Debar Elohim would be the word of the Most High, right? But in this sense, with a mem on the front, it's it's genuinely used as desert or wilderness, midbar. 
if we just had Debar, and again, Google is not very reliable. Debar means a word. Midbar is your word here for today. Mim Dalad Bet Resh. And your final word for today's is Motz, which means death. Mem Vav Tav. It means death or to die. It can also be spelled with two yodes. What we're looking at is a truncated version, as you see there, the two yodes. Often you'll see it in a text as three letters. And that is your vocabulary for today, you guys. And so uh, we we'll transition to now for the, the this um, search exercise that I've been talking about. Um, and and one of the reasons kind of this this came about is we just came through the Passover season, but also a friend of mine who um, reached out to me. He does this every few years. He is one of the lead researchers and um, authors on the Shroud of Turin. He's been studying the, the Shroud of Turin for forty years. Uh, his name is Russ Rialt, and I uh, also know Barry Schwartz, who was also another uh, researcher who was, a, who, by the way, both of these men were atheists when they first encountered this shroud, okay? So, so keep that in mind. And it was because of the evidence that led them to believe that um, the biblical account and the historical accounts from other places like Pilate's words, Caiaphas's words, and... Um, you know, the testimony of um, Mary and Joseph and um, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus. And I know some of you guys are going, where is this? We're going to talk about that. But because in part of your research, sometimes you got to look at text and historical record outside the Bible. And so these texts come from the Vatican and they were preserved because they were thought to be very valuable. And so uh, a, a couple of guys in the 1800s had found these documents that were written in Latin of these historical accounts that were outside the Bible that point to the same event. Uh, some are favorable, some are not favorable, but I think we will see unbiased testimony and be able to draw, you know, information from that in our search. And so we're for the next couple of weeks, we're going to kind of be looking at that. And I'm going to be, uh, you know, uh, enabling you guys to do a um, a controlled search in the sense that you're gonna guys are gonna have some boundaries uh, in in what we're doing. You'll have an access term to search and some of the known terms there, but you'll also be um, you know asked to find any additional terms there. All right. So this will be a subject that's known. Right. Everybody, if you're a believer in Yeshua and follow Yeshua, you know about this event. Right. It's a historical event. It's no question this event took place. We see it in the text. We're also going to look at the historical accounts and compare those and, and use that in our search methodologies. Everybody with me? All right. So um, the very first thing I want to do with leading into this is, is show you a little video that I got based on the forensics information of the shroud. Okay. Okay. And so what I want you to do is take that that notebook that you, that you got that you wrote down your vocabulary. And as you're listening to this video, this is something I would quite frequently do anytime I'm, I'm researching something or our topic for a search. I may find some resource on, on the Internet and listen to it or watch that video and take notes. Terms that just kind of jump out to you. Oh, we got to see if that's there. Right. I'll point out some of the obvious ones, but I got I want you guys as an exercise for this. Think in the in the in the mind frame of a, of a researcher, possibilities, you know, some of the search terms that you would want to search for this particular topic, right? So as you're listening to this film, take notes. And at the end of that, we'll we will, you know, discuss some of the access terms and some of the terms that you guys will be searching um, along this. Uh, exercise that we'll do in the next com couple of weeks uh, down the road. Okay. All right. So stand by. Let me cue that up for you. We'll watch that together. It's you know, like 30 minutes long. Very good presentation. Um, this 
creator did. I got to warn you, first of all, this is a little hard to uh, to listen to because of the content that uh, we're talking about here, the, the suffering of Yeshua. So, uh, and all this is intentional, by the way. I knew this would be a thing. Uh, I want you guys to be passionate in your searches. And so starting you off as an, a, with an exercise like this, and we're going to be doing a series of Yeshua codes, let this inspire you. Let this get you in the frame of mind of the, of the crucifixion and the resurrection and how you would try to prove this uh, using the text. And, and one thing I'm excited about in this is all of the known um, Yeshua codes about the Shroud of Turin currently reside in the Tanakh, which means... The text that we're going to search in the Peshitta concerning the historical event is untouched. And I guarantee you, and, and I can't wait to see the revelation when it happens. And I've been talking about this with Scott here the past week, that that text is, unco is un untouched, especially for this topic. So you guys are on the precipice of something very amazing because this information is going to be used that, that we, we gather in my friend's book, uh, Russ Briard is, is writing another book on the Shroud of Turin. He recently messaged me about any more additional information that we found on that, which inspired me to do this exercise with you guys. So uh, just think about that, okay? So any of any of the uh, uh, anomalies that we find as a collective group, we're gonna we're gonna pass that along to Russ, and he's gonna use that in his book to reach millions of people and show them the evidence that this is a historical event that history and archaeology and Bible forensics point to this being as a valid event. It, this really took place. So keep that in mind as we watch this. findings being published in a new book out today on the Shroud of Turin. That's the linen cloth believed to bear Jesus's imprint as he was being prepared for burial. And now there's new research that may disprove the claim of people who've said it's an rather than the time. being published in a new book out today on the Shroud of Turin. That's the linen cloth believed to bear Jesus's imprint as he was being prepared for burial. And now there's new research that may disprove the claim of people who've said it's an elaborate fake. Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is indeed a fascinating artifact that has sparked considerable debate and interest over the centuries. There are no substances on While many believe it to be the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, others approach it with skepticism, citing various scientific analyses and historical considerations. The discovery of the faint image on the shroud, particularly its clarity and photographic negatives, has intrigued scientists and believers alike. The three-dimensional details apparent in the image have also puzzled researchers, as they seem to surpass the capabilities of medieval artists. Additionally, the documented history of the shroud adds to its mystique and allure. The revelation of the rare stitch on the back of the shroud, linking it to the Masada fortress in Israel, provides an intriguing archaeological connection. This connection adds another layer to the debate surrounding the Shroud's authenticity, aligning it with historical events and locations relevant to Jesus' time. The depiction of wounds consistent with Roman scourging and crucifixion on the Shroud further fuels the belief that it could indeed be the burial cloth of Jesus. The presence of blood and clear fluid on the cloth, particularly around the chest wound, adds to the complexity of its narrative. Join us today as we delve deeper into the enigmatic tale of the Shroud of Turin, a relic shrouded in mystery and controversy. Uncover the secrets hidden within its faint image and explore the fascinating journey of this ancient artifact. We'll unravel the intriguing connection between the shroud and the historical events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion. Discover the latest scientific findings and archaeological insights that shed light on the authenticity of this revered relic. Subscribe now to our channel 
to unlock access to this captivating exploration of the Shroud of Turin. Don't miss out on the opportunity to join the conversation and engage with fellow enthusiasts as we delve into the mysteries of this sacred artifact. And, as you watch, ponder these thought-provoking questions. 1. What implications does the unique stitching pattern discovered on the back of the Shroud have for our understanding of its origin and journey? 2. How do modern scientific analyses, such as carbon dating and forensic examination, shape our perception of the Shroud's authenticity and significance? Let's delve in. Shroud of Turin, an archaeological evidence that proves the Bible. The Shroud of Turin, also called the Holy Shroud, is a piece of linen cloth depicting a faint image. It has been revered for centuries as the authentic burial shroud that was used to wrap the body of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, just just right off the bat, right off the bat in this, face cloth, burial shroud, holy shroud, body of Yeshua, anything crucifixion related would be potentially a search per, you know, parameter that we look for, okay? And we want to look for multiple ones. At any given time, you guys, you probably be working on multiple codes at one time because you're triangulating something, right? You're trying to, with, okay, so let's say we're trying to prove whether something is or is not, okay? Is the Shroud of Turin legitimate? Okay, that would be our search parameters in this. So we would look for, for multiple codes that will point us into a direction, it, sort of like, a, a, you know, in triangulating a position on a grid map, we want multiple parameters that we can we can use to pinpoint something. Does that make sense? Right? So several words that we could pull from this already as search terms, okay? After his crucifixion, and on which an image of Jesus' body was miraculously imprinted it. 1898. Second Pier produced the first photographs of the Shroud, which showed that the human image on it can be seen more clearly in a black and white photographic negative than in its natural sepia color. This discovery is still relevant today, as it helps in better understanding the Shroud and its features. The Shroud has a documented history dating back to 1354, when it was exhibited in a church in north central France. Amazingly, this negative image possesses 3D details that go beyond the capabilities of paintings, botanical, and DNA connections. In a pivotal moment of revelation in 2002, conservation efforts in Italy unveiled a hidden secret. The removal of the 16th century backing cloth exposed a rare type of stitch on the back of the shroud, a stitch known only from one other place, the Masada Fortress in Israel. This archaeological connection adds layers of authenticity to the shroud story, as Masada was a witness to the Jewish revolt, aligning with the historical timeline of Jesus. The Shroud's narrative, the presence of multiple wounds consistent with Roman scourge marks on the cloth match, lead balls from a whip. There's a wound on the chest, with both blood and clear fluid, suggesting the heart stopped beating. The Shroud's journey is not just about what's on it, but where it's been. The agony and burial of Jesus through the Shroud of Turin. As we dive deep into the story depicted on the Shroud of Turin, we are transported to the harrowing moments leading to Jesus' crucifixion. Before the final act of sacrifice, Jesus endured a brutal and dehumanizing series of torments, each excruciating detail etched into the fabric of the shroud. Stripped and subjected to a merciless flogging, the flagrums used were tipped with both blunt and sharp objects, tearing into his flesh and reducing it to shreds. The agonizing process left the body battered and covered in wounds. To intensify his sufferings, soldiers fashioned a crown of thorns, not delicately woven but hastily twisted from branches. After this merciless display of brutality, Jesus, now bearing the weight of his own cross, was dressed in his blood-stained garments and forced to carry the 150-pound burden. Despite the pain and loss of blood, he struggled forward each step a grueling journey. The wooden cross dug into his shoulder, exacerbating the wounds from the flogging and inflicting additional torment as it banged against the thorny crown, sending sharp stabs of pain into his head. It is difficult for most of us to anticipate a major incident, let alone a scourge. Let us see what caused that much detail to show up on the Turin. Tripping and falling under the immense weight of the cross, Jesus endured yet another wave of suffering. The impact crushed his chest against the ground, twisting his arm and wrenching it severely out of its socket. The cross, now atop him, pressed into the back of his neck and shoulders, partially paralyzing him. His head sagged to the right, rendering his right side useless in the state of agony. 
Heartless soldiers callously pulled him up by his dislocated arm, forcing him to continue the journey with the cross now on his left shoulder. Bent over in pain and weakness, his right arm hung helplessly by his side. The staggering steps forward were a testament to his resilience amidst unimaginable suffering. As we reflect on these vivid details imprinted on the Shroud of Turin, the narrative unfolds with stark realism. Each mark, each wound, tells a story of unparalleled sacrifice and suffering. The Shroud, like a silent witness to these agonizing moments, invites us to contemplate the depth of Jesus' sacrifice and the profound love that compelled him to endure such brutality for the sake of humanity. In the end, the Shroud not only preserves the physical remnants of this crucible of pain, but also serves as a powerful testament to the resilience of faith and the enduring message of hope that emerged from the darkest hours of human history. Another question is, who originally owned this cloth? Did Jesus pay for his burial, or was there someone else? Keep watching till the end, and we will cover this. The crucifixion and burial on the Shroud of Turin. As we approach the culmination of Jesus' journey, the Shroud of Turin vividly captures the heart-wrenching scene on Golgotha. His clothes, now soaked with blood, were mercilessly ripped from his body, reopening wounds that had started to adhere to the fabric. Helplessly thrown onto the cross, the soldiers proceeded to nail his already distorted and dislocated right arm, causing excruciating pain as nerves and ligaments were severed. When Jesus' body reached the tomb, it was placed on a bed of perfumed spices. The headcloth was removed and the shroud was folded over him loosely wrapped with a thin strip of linen. This gentle yet hurried burial was necessitated by the impending Sabbath. His lifeless form, wrapped in pure linen, was left in the tomb, the entrance sealed with a rolled stone. Description the shroud is a rectangular piece of cloth that measures approximately 4.4 by 1.1 meter, 14 to 5 inches by 3 feet 7 inches, and is made of flax fibrils woven in a 3 to 1 herringbone twill pattern. The most distinctive feature of the cloth is the faint, brownish image of a man seen from the front and back. On the cloth, there is an image of a man with a beard, mustache, and shoulder-length hair parted in the middle. He appears muscular and tall with various experts measuring him as between 1.70 to 1.88 meters, 557 inches to 652 inches. In 1532, a fire broke out in the chapel located in Chambéry, France, causing damage to the shroud. The linen suffered burn holes and scorched patches on both sides due to contact with molten silver, which burned through it in some areas while it was folded. To repair the damage, nuns sewed 14 large triangular patches and eight smaller ones onto the cloth. Conservation. The shroud has undergone several restorations to preserve it and prevent further damage and contamination. It is stored in an airtight case made of laminated bulletproof glass. The case is temperature and humidity controlled to prevent chemical changes. The shroud itself is placed on an aluminum support that slides on runners and is stored flat within the case. According to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, Joseph of Arimathea wrapped Jesus' body in a linen cloth and laid it in a newly built tomb. However, the Gospel of John suggests that strips of linen were used for the same purpose. Joseph of Arimathea was a biblical figure who played an important role in the burial of Jesus Christ. His account can be found in each of the four Gospels, Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 19, Mark chapter 15, verses 42 through 46. When evening had already come because it was... You will also see in, in the coming you know weeks that we studied this that from the Roman accounts that that Joseph also gave a testimony. So did Nicodemus, so did Caiaphas, and many others that was sent to Tiberius Caesar in um, in Rome, and it's all documented in Latin. And it, and so it's very fascinating for us to look at those accounts because this is this is historical record. It's not this is not made up. Okay, this this is actually uh, imagine this when Pilate is witnessing all this and going through all this, he has to send a report to Tiberius Caesar and it contained all of these testimonies. You guys. It was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent and respected member of the Council Sanhedrin Jewish High Court, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. And he courageously dared to go in before Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, only six hours after being crucified, and he summoned the centurion and asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that Jesus was in fact dead, he gave the body to Joseph by granting him permission to remove it. So Joseph, bearing the name of his hometown, Arimathea in Judea, to distinguish him from others, procured a fine linen cloth for the solemn task of wrapping Jesus' body. With 
care, he descended the cross and tenderly enveloped the lifeless form before placing it in a rock-hewn tomb. A large wheel-shaped stone sealed the entrance, marking the beginning of Jesus' entombment. Though the biblical accounts provide sparse details about Joseph of Arimathea, they offer glimpses into his character and actions. Luke 23-50 identifies him as a member of the Jewish Council of Sanhedrin, the body responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. Yet, verse 51 uncovers his covert allegiance to Jesus, despite his outward affiliation with the council. Mark 15:43 echoes this sentiment, as noted in Matthew 27:57, adds another layer to his persona, though its origins remain obscure. Nevertheless, the Bible portrays him as a man of integrity and virtue, Luke 23:50. Following Jesus' crucifixion, Joseph undertook a daring mission, approaching the Roman governor Pilate to secure Jesus' body. Accompanied by Nicodemus, another figure with a clandestine interest in Jesus, Joseph obtained permission to prepare the body for burial. In accordance with Jewish custom, they meticulously wrapped the body in linen strips infused with myrrh and aloe. However, time was fleeting, as they toiled on the eve of the Sabbath, the day of preparation, before the onset of Jewish Sabbath rest. So Joseph and Nicodemus quickly placed Jesus in Joseph's own tomb, which was located in a garden close to the place of crucifixion. Joseph and Nicodemus were unaware that they were fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy by placing Jesus in Joseph's tomb. The prophecy stated that he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9. This is just one of many prophecies that serve to confirm Jesus' identity as the Messiah and Son of God. According to the Gospel of John, Simon Peter entered the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and found strips of linen along with the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still in its place, separate from the linen. However, in the Gospel of Luke, it is mentioned that Peter ran to the tomb and saw the strips of linen lying by themselves while bending over Jesus' suffering. Did not just start at the cross, the way to Jerusalem. And I just want to say right here, you guys, if you can imagine yourself being in this event or, or, you know, in this time and this event takes place, these people involved, obviously they would have preserved these cloths, correct? So it's very plausible to assume that they just wouldn't discard these cloths, even though they didn't know the image was there, they would have understood the profound uh, implication here, right? And so it is my belief even from a young age, when I was first, uh, you know, exposed to the to the Shroud of Turin, that this is legitimate, okay? These events took place roughly a week before Jesus was crucified. He knew he was headed to the spot where he would die, placing himself on Calvary's altar as a sacrifice for sin. The disciples were nervous, and they had a sense of foreboding in the air. Although Jesus had previously stated that he would die, they were unprepared for this message. They didn't want to hear Jesus talk like that. They had visions of an earthly kingdom. On the road to Jerusalem, we encounter Jesus alone with his thoughts, and the disciples are taken aback. Then, as the crowd grew larger, they became terrified. Jesus needed to say something encouraging, a sorrowful prediction. Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were perplexed at what Jesus had said, and those who were following were alarmed and afraid. And again he took the twelve disciples aside, and began telling them what was going to happen to him, saying, Listen very carefully. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed, and handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, Romans. They will mock and ridicule him and spit on him, and whip, scourge him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise from the dead. Jesus said he would be betrayed, sentenced, and executed. Matthew chapter 8 verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must of necessity suffer many things, and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and must be put to death, and after three days, rise from death to life. He had warned them that this would happen. The word that jumps out in that statement is would. Jesus spoke about the necessity of his cross. Mark chapter 9 verse 31. Because he was teaching his disciples, and preparing them for the future. He told them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed and handed over to men who are his enemies, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise from the dead. Three days later he mentioned his death again, but this time he used the term will as he described what would happen to him. 
the emphasis was on the cruelty of the crucifixion. When Jesus made these prophecies, he was completely in control. Jesus handled his death in a way that we cannot. We understand that death is unavoidable, but we have no idea when, where, or how we will die. Jesus was fully aware of his death at Calvary. Instead of becoming a victim of circumstance or a martyr for a cause, Jesus was determined to pass. No one takes my life, but I lay it down of myself, he told the followers. John chapter 10 verse 18. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down voluntarily. I am authorized and have power to lay it down and to give it up, and I am authorized and have power to take it back. This command I have received from my Father. Mark chapter 10 verses 33 through 34 saying, Listen very carefully. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, Romans. They will mock and ridicule him and spit on him and whip scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise from the dead. Jesus also predicted that he would be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes, the religious authorities of the day, and would condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They would insult, scourge, and spit on Jesus, he predicted. That's exactly what they did. At the end, Jesus foreshadowed his own resurrection. For some reason, this passed right over the disciples' minds. They never seemed to hear that Jesus would rise from the dead. The resurrection continues to astound everyone, including many Christians. Despite all of this, Jesus rose from the grave three days later. Jesus is as alive today as he was when he arose from the tomb. A shameful ambition. Every time Jesus mentioned the cross, another spiritual defect in these disciples' life was revealed. But that's what the cross does. It reveals the human heart, showing us how self-centered we are. In Mark 10, 35, 36, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached Jesus with a bold request. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Intrigued, Jesus inquired about their desire. Matthew's account adds that their mother, Salome, was behind their plea, seeking positions of honor for her sons in Jesus' kingdom. Matthew 20, 20, 21. Their ambition was clear to secure prominent places of authority, one on Jesus' right and the other on his left, in his future glory, Mark 10, 37. This request reflected their desire for prestige in Jesus' kingdom, yet Jesus saw beyond their ambition. In Mark 10, 38, he questioned their readiness for the responsibilities that came with such positions. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Jesus was alluding to the suffering and sacrifice he would endure, symbolized by the cup of agony he would drink at Calvary, John 18, 11. Despite their initial confidence, Jesus foretold that James and John would indeed share in his suffering and baptism of mission, Mark 10, 39. Their response echoes our own eagerness to follow Christ, often fixating on the glory while overlooking the challenges. Yet Jesus reminds us that true discipleship entails embracing both the joy and the trials, following his example of sacrificial service and obedience, John 18:11. Just as Jesus challenged James and John, he challenges us to consider the full implications of discipleship. Are we willing to endure hardship and sacrifice for the sake of his kingdom? The lesson from their encounter resonates with all believers, reminding us that the path to glory often traverses through trials and tribulations. Mark 10 40, 41 reveals Jesus' response to James and John's request for positions of honor. But to sit on my right or left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. The news of this conversation left the other ten disciples indignant, as they too desired such positions. This incident occurred just a week before Jesus' crucifixion, with his disciples preoccupied with thoughts of power and glory, rather than grasping the imminent sacrifice. As Jesus approached the final days before his crucifixion, his focus was on Jerusalem, where he would willingly identify with humanity and serve others selflessly. He gathered his disciples to impart a crucial lesson on true greatness, highlighting the stark contrast between his ways and the world's expectations. First, Jesus demonstrated his willingness to identify with humanity. Second, he emphasized the importance of serving others rather than seeking personal glory. Third, Jesus clarified his ultimate purpose, to offer his life as a ransom for many, paying the price for their release. The concept of ransom beautifully encapsulates Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, dispelling the misconception that his journey to Calvary was easy. The Gospels recount Jesus' overwhelming sorrow in Gethsemane, where he faced the prospect of excruciating death, humiliation, and insults. The innocence of Jesus, an innocent man dying for others, is vividly portrayed in these accounts. Jesus' prayers in Gethsemane particularly, Let this cup pass from me, 
revealed his complete surrender to God's will before the crucifixion. The metaphorical cup symbolized the bitter suffering he was destined to endure, presenting a deep internal struggle. When Jesus asked his disciples if they could drink the same cup, they confidently replied, We are able. However, Jesus, aware of the depth of suffering, warned them to stay vigilant against temptation, acknowledging the weakness of the flesh. In the midst of Jesus' internal struggle, he expressed deep grief and sorrow, showcasing his full humanity. His foreknowledge of the impending events did not diminish the emotional and physical toll he experienced. This profound moment in Gethsemane underscores Jesus' humanity and the immense sacrifice he willingly embraced for the redemption of many. Mark chapter 8 verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must of necessity suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and must be put to death and after three days rise from death to life. The torment that he was going to go through was going to be more than just physical. It was also going to be mental and spiritual. Jesus was aware that it was God's plan for him to be crucified, that God wanted him to be pierced for our transgressions and wounded for our healing. Jesus knew that this was the will of God. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 5 through 7, but he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus loves mankind, but his humanity dreaded the pain and sorrow he faced, and it drove him to ask his father, let this cup pass from me. The phrase, let this cup pass from me, appears in Jesus' prayer, and it contains two significant qualifications. To begin, he utters the prayer. If it is possible, Jesus implores his father to let him choose an alternative path to redemption for humankind, if one exists. Jesus did not want to die, but he followed the will of God. The events that occurred after he prayed demonstrate that there was no other way. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the only one that could possibly redeem the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Second, Jesus prays, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was committed to the will of God, body, mind, and soul. The prayer of the righteous is always dependent on the will of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus exemplified the victory of the spirit over the flesh by wholeheartedly submitting to God's will. When we face challenging times, we find solace in knowing that Jesus empathizes with our struggle to align our desires with God's will. This internal conflict is a natural aspect of being human, one that Jesus, our Redeemer, fully understood and experienced. In Hebrews 2.17, we learn that Jesus, in his humanity, shared our experiences to become a compassionate high priest. He fulfilled his mission of seeking and saving the lost, despite enduring suffering until the end. His prayerful communion with God during this tumultuous time reflects a deep, intimate relationship. During Jesus' agony in the garden, an angel appeared to strengthen him, signifying heavenly support during difficult times. Despite facing rejection and death, Jesus prayed earnestly, laying his burdens before God. This portrayal humanizes Jesus, revealing his capacity to comprehend and empathize with our struggles. Hebrews 4.15 assures us that Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses, having experienced temptation yet without sin. His character and example demonstrate how we can confront life's trials while relying on God's strength. Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane exemplifies a profound submission to God's will amidst intense emotional turmoil. Jesus' prayer was marked by honesty, humility, and emotional depth, contrasting with our often superficial approach to prayer. True prayer demands sincerity and effort, qualities embodied by Jesus in Gethsemane. Rather than merely going through the motions, Jesus engaged in authentic dialogue with God, expressing his deepest emotions and fears. Luke, a physician, highlights Jesus' sweat resembling blood drops, likely a result of hematidrosis induced by extreme stress. This physical manifestation underscores the intensity of Jesus' anguish and agony. His vulnerability in this moment reveals the depth of his humanity and 
the severity of his impending sacrifice. Jesus' prayer demonstrates his unwavering commitment to God's will, even as he pleaded for an alternative path. Despite the silence that followed, Jesus resolved to follow God's plan, receiving strength from heaven to fulfill his calling. This passage illustrates the profound union between submission to divine will and the divine strength provided. In facing the trial of the cross, Jesus exhibited remarkable traits, including honesty, humility, and reliance on God. His example inspires us to persevere in prayer and seek God's guidance amidst life's challenges. Through Jesus' humanity, we find reassurance that God understands our struggles and offers strength in times of need. The journey through Gethsemane offers valuable lessons, reminding us of the importance of spiritual battles, the comfort of divine presence, and the necessity of submission and strength received through prayer. Jesus' sacrifice on Golgotha, though shrouded in mystery, stands as a beacon of hope and redemption, symbolizing God's profound love for humanity. As we reflect on Jesus' journey from Gethsemane to Golgotha, let us remember the significance of his sacrifice and the assurance of salvation it offers. Though the exact location of Golgotha may remain uncertain, its spiritual significance remains unwavering, serving as a reminder of Jesus' ultimate victory over sin and death. Jesus' death on the cross, symbolized by Golgotha, represents the culmination of God's plan for redemption. His sacrifice, the only one capable of forgiving sin and reconciling humanity with God, offers hope and salvation to all who believe. As we contemplate the magnitude of Jesus' sacrifice, may we find comfort and assurance in his love and grace. The distinctive stitching pattern discovered on the reverse side of the Shroud of Turin presents a compelling avenue for enhancing our comprehension of its origin and historical trajectory. This unique feature not only showcases the craftsmanship employed during its creation, but also offers a potential geographical and cultural fingerprint. By subjecting the stitching to meticulous analysis, experts can glean insights into the historical context, contributing significantly to the ongoing discourse surrounding the Shroud's authenticity. In the realm of textile craftsmanship, the stitching pattern emerges as a critical facet for discerning the origin of ancient artifacts. The intricacy, style, and techniques employed in the creation of such stitching provide a nuanced lens through which the cultural and geographical roots of the shroud can be unraveled. This stitching, like a distinct signature, carries the imprint of historical practices, enabling experts to draw parallels with known traditions and methods prevalent during the period associated with the shroud. The stitching pattern becomes a veritable time capsule, offering a glimpse into the textile artistry of the era in question. The intricacies of the stitches, the choice of materials, and the overall composition can be scrutinized against the backdrop of historical textile practices. This analysis may reveal regional variations or cultural idiosyncrasies that align with specific locales or traditions. Consequently, the stitching pattern acts as a pivotal clue, guiding researchers in their quest to unlock the mysteries of the Shroud's origin. Beyond its role as a cultural signifier, the stitching pattern assumes even greater significance when considered in the context of the Shroud's historical journey. This artifact, purported to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, has a documented history dating back to the 14th century when it was publicly exhibited in a church in north central France. However, the discovery of the unique stitching pattern on the back of the Shroud introduces a new layer of complexity to its narrative. One pivotal moment in the Shroud's historical revelation occurred in 2002 during conservation efforts in Italy. The removal of a 16th century backing cloth exposed a stitching pattern on the back of the shroud that bore resemblance to a stitch known from another historical site, the Masada Fortress in Israel. This archaeological connection, linking the shroud to Masada, adds layers of authenticity to its story, aligning it with a historical timeline that coincides with the life of Jesus. The implications of this stitching pattern for the Shroud's journey become more pronounced when considering the socio-political context of Masada. The fortress was a witness to the Jewish revolt, providing a historical backdrop that aligns with the crucifixion of Jesus. This synchronicity adds weight to the Shroud's narrative, reinforcing its connection to a specific historical period and imbuing it with a palpable authenticity that transcends mere speculation. Furthermore, the stitching pattern serves as a roadmap for tracing the shroud's trajectory through time. By meticulously examining repairs, alterations, and the overall condition of the stitching, researchers can piece together a chronicle of the shroud's custodianship. This forensic analysis becomes instrumental in authenticating its historical journey and validating claims about its purported origin. 
The stitching pattern's role in corroborating or challenging assertions about the shroud's authenticity cannot be overstated. When aligned with known textile practices of the time, the stitching becomes a corroborative piece of evidence, reinforcing the claim that the shroud could indeed date back to the era of Jesus' crucifixion. Conversely, any anomalies or anachronisms in the stitching would necessitate a reassessment of its historical provenance, prompting a more nuanced and critical evaluation of its authenticity. In essence, the stitching pattern on the back of the Shroud of Turin transcends the realm of mere speculation. It stands as a tangible and distinctive feature that beckons researchers to delve deeper into the intricacies of ancient textile craftsmanship. The stitching's potential to reveal the cultural and geographical roots of the Shroud, coupled with its role in tracing the artifact's historical journey, positions it as a linchpin in the ongoing quest to unravel the mysteries surrounding this enigmatic relic. Modern scientific analyses, including carbon dating and forensic examination, play a pivotal role in shaping our perception of the authenticity and significance of the Shroud of Turin. These rigorous investigative techniques provide invaluable insights into the origins, composition, and historical context of the artifact, offering both corroborative evidence and avenues for critical inquiry. By subjecting the Shroud to comprehensive scientific scrutiny, researchers endeavor to unravel its mysteries while navigating the intricate intersection of faith, history, and empirical inquiry. Carbon dating stands as one of the most widely recognized scientific methods employed in the study of the Shroud. By analyzing the ratio of carbon isotopes present in organic material, researchers can estimate the age of the artifact with a high degree of precision. In the case of the Shroud, carbon dating conducted in 1988 yielded a range of dates spanning from 1260 to 1390 AD, leading some to conclude that the artifact originated during the medieval period rather than the time of Jesus Christ. This finding sparked considerable debate and controversy within both scientific and religious communities, prompting a re-evaluation of previously held beliefs about the Shroud's authenticity. We're eager to hear your thoughts on the Shroud. Do you believe it authentically depicts Jesus, or do you consider it a mere hoax? Share your views in the comments below. All right, so, um, you know, just a side note on that last little piece of information he uh, he shared there. Science is actually proven because of the known historical uh, data that samples taken for the carbon dating was taken from the repairs that were made from the fires, and um, which all you know obviously gives us a false positive. And now we know from other you know, research that's done that it actually it it actually shows that it, it's an older um, garment material. Anyway, um, the reason why this is important, you guys, is uh, you know for me this is the, probably one of the most uh, okay. So when I was twelve years old. I was pretty, I was, I was a skeptic. Um, yeah, at six, my uncle, uh, because I had witnessed my stepfather committing suicide and, and he was talking to me about death and, and things, he had told me that there was no Santa Claus, there was no tooth fairy, no Easter bunny. And oh, by the way, we're all going to die one day. Okay. And this is our six year old. So I became a, a skeptic. In the sense that I didn't trust anybody. I didn't trust adults. And at six years old, after I witnessed my stepfather committing suicide, or, or was was um, a part of that in the aftermath, um, I started going to church, Sunday school. And, um, and they were telling me about this Jesus, right? And I just had this experience where I found out that everything that these adults were telling me were, was basically a lie. And here now there, there, there's adults teaching me about this Jesus. OK, so fast forward a, little, a few years to where I'm about 12. My grandfather and my grandmother, my step grandmother, go to Israel. And on this trip, they go to Greece and they also go to Rome. And at that time, and I think I, I want to say it was the early 80s. 83, 85, somewhere around there, they were able to see the Shroud of Turin. And some of the things that they brought back were like these postcards or pictures of the of the Shroud and things like that. And 
And I re distinctly remember my grandfather giving me this and, um, you know, and it was something that I held on to. I wanted to believe in Yeshua, right? But, but I was skeptical. I was like, I just, you know, you, you're at that point where you're kind of on the fence. You want to believe, but you remember what you were told before about other, you know, subjects, right? So I had this little index card like thing, uh, probably about that big, you know, uh, postcard kind of thing of the, of the shroud. And I would look at this thing for hours and hours and hours. And if you guys know my story, I, I, uh, me and my brother used to read to each other the Encyclopedia of the Bible um, a lot. And so I was very familiar with the, the stories of the Bible, especially the crucifixion and everything that happened there. So I wanted to believe and I held on to this little, you know, card and and I would look at it for hours and just imagine, is this really Jesus? Is this really the one that, that supposedly died for me? Right. Fast forward until I get into the codes. What do you know? Very first subject, one of the first subjects. And I think if there's a strong number two, it would be the two witnesses that I searched was the Shroud of Turin, the resurrection of Yeshua. I got into this phase where I was doing all these Yeshua codes, and, and it was, wasn't that I, I didn't believe in Yeshua. I just wanted satisfaction of seeing what I believe was confirmed, if that makes any sense. And so I would do all these searches on Yeshua, the, the crucifixion, the resurrection, yada, 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 Shroud of Turin. I was going to... Um, conferences with prophecy watchers and this is the first time i met russ briot and um some of the others russ briot is one of the experts on the shroud of turin and um i started talking to him about the shroud and he would you know in in my field searching codes he asked me had he ever found anything on the shroud of turin and so that led down the road of that search and i gotta tell you you guys um, and, and the reason why I'm, I want you guys to start out in that kind of uh, mind, mind, uh, you know, thinking along those ways of, of Yeshua codes is because of, uh, you know, I want to design this this class to, to take you on the journey that I went on in my searches. So so some of these exercises that I'm going to have you guys do are some of the early searches that I did. And I'm going to give you the access term and some of the words and let you guys find any additional terms. And so this will help you go through the uh, motions, and so to speak, the, the muscle memory of typing out letters and getting something correct and spelling it out correctly and all those kinds of things. Because if I just turn you loose on search and codes, what most of you are going to want to do is go search predictive codes, future codes. Or, or search something out about, you know, something that's going to happen in the future and things like that, which is okay. You guys, we will get to that point. But I'd like to to walk with you a, a little while and and train you in this, in, in something that's known, right? Um, anytime we do Yeshua codes, it's pretty, some, it's pretty much something we can, you know, count on, especially if you're a believer, Right. You know, these things, you know, the story of Yeshua, you know, the crucifixion, the resurrection, you know, all these details. Right. And so with something that's known as far as a search term, we have an easier time in, in putting the puzzle pieces together. If we're going to go out and start searching something unknown, like a predictive code, something that's going to happen in the future and, and, and more akin to looking at a crystal ball, even though that's not what we're doing. By the time you guys get to that point, you, it's it's not about that. It's about hearing the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's when he'll reveal to you something that's unknown. But you got to crawl before you walk, you guys. And so I'm going to take you some through some of these known things that we can search out and see that they're there. Get the muscle memory and, and searching those codes and, and being correct in typing out those letters before you turn loose and you start looking for things about your family and, and, you know, all those things. And I, I've had independent uh, conversations with several on uh, some of the ideas that you, some of you guys want to search. And so, um, and in those conversations, I, I, I told you that I want 
just be patient. We'll get to that point. I want to, I want to teach you some fundamental things first. Here's the subject that we're going to work on first is the resurrection of Yeshua. I think it's going to bless you. And I'm recount, you know, looking back on what it did for me, you guys. And I got to tell you, it's one of the most powerful things that I did. Searching codes, very personal. I didn't produce a lot about this. And, and, it, and the only reason I did was because of uh, Russ Briald and he wanted me to share some of those things. But in the moment that I'm searching it out and I'm kind of, you know, doing this for my own satisfaction, for my own, um, uh, you, you know, to kind of solidify what you believe in your faith. I'm looking at Yeshua codes and I'm looking at the Shroud of Turin and the resurrection and all those kinds of things. And I'm getting to that point. Where there's a confidence there that, uh, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, I can tell you that this is a true thing, right? So it occurred to me very early on that these codes can confirm a matter, right? I told you everything that was, is, and will be is encoded. And that, you know, any given day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, we can search any historical event, any civil war you know, assassination of John F. Kennedy, you name it, we can find it in the codes, right? How do we know? How do we know that these things are valid unless we have a control or a, a baseline? And I like to call this baseline what we know about Yeshua from the text. Everything that we see from the text and the historical accounts of Yeshua, this is what we know. And if we can search these things out, like Isaiah 53, and I got to tell you, I believe every word of Isaiah 53, and I believe it, it is Yeshua, and it's not what the rabbis say, that it's the nation of Israel. This is talking about a man. And not only that, that this man came and fulfilled the words of the prophet 700 years after the fact, and some even more, right? If the codes are true, then what he did will will reflect inside of those texts, and that's that's what you guys are going to see with the, this this search topic on Yeshua, right? Here's one of the things that that was very profound to me in this research topic, you guys, and, and why I want to share this with you, and I want you to experience the same thing. And I don't expect that you will. I think that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal things on an individual level for you guys when you're doing this kind of search. But for me, as I'm doing this search, there came a point where the Holy Spirit came upon me and, and you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm doing this search and I'm I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, all the variables and everything that happened. And, and if, if my memory is correct, I probably watched the Passion of the Christ right before this search that I'm doing. And so I'm very emotionally charged at that point. And the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and this is where he reveals to me. Because I remember as a child learning, um, you know, John 3, 16, that you should, he gave us his, his son for, for all of us, right? And for all of our sins. And so as he's enduring this on the cross, and he's spilling this blood, and I'm searching out this code, and I'm thinking about all this stuff, it occurs to me, because I started thinking about the mathematics on this. Okay, so he came to forgive every single one of us. And there's a lot of people on the earth right now. I think there's 9 billion people on the planet. So what does that quantify to? How do we break that down? If every drop of his blood was shed for us, how does that break down? And what the Holy Spirit said to me was every blood platelet was accounted for. Every single one. And we're talking about billions and billions of blood platelets that he spilled. Red blood cells, white blood cells, every single one had a specific name. That's what he did for us. And as I'm doing this code and I'm realizing, oh, my gosh, it starts coming down, coming home. Uh, and I realize, oh, my gosh, we're all accounted for in this. For my sin, your sin, everyone's sin, we're all represented in his blood. He spilled his blood for us. And and no and no exactly no drop was wasted. Every single drop 
was accounted for by a human being that has existed, will exist, or exists exist now. And that was very profound for me. And I would I would weep sitting at my computer. Sometimes I had to get up and just walk away and just just weep on on, on the, the profoundness of that, right? And so this this would and, I, and I'm trying to describe to you in best that I can the the process that I would be in, in these searches and the and the, and the emotional level that that you can potentially um, you know encounter in this. It, these some of these things are hard to comprehend, and then you see it encoded, right? And it kind of brings it home to you, and then you got to digest that, right? And so. Uh, you know, I wanted to share that with you guys on this. I think one of the best learning process in searching codes is, is start from a baseline, something that is known, and, and that would be Yeshua codes, and then build on that. If we're going to go to predictive codes later, I, I can show you guys how that, you know, how that takes place. And, and by the way, that is a lot of prayer that, that's involved in that. That's not just jumping on your computer and finding something that's going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen. This is going to take a lot of prayer and supplication, sometimes even, you know, fasting on a subject. And, and by golly, Yah will reveal something very profound to you. And then you'll find it. And that's another confirmation. It's another witness that you're on the right trail. <clears throat> so that will happen. But we got to build to that point. We can't just hit the ground running, you guys. And, and uh, with the analogy of, you know, being grandfather with uh, learning to ride the bicycle, it, it it's, you know, there's it's trial and error. There's going to be times you might fall down, right? But you keep going and you keep looking, right? So these, these initial searches that I'm going to have you guys do are going to be with boundaries. They're going to be established. It's, I'm not just going to turn you loose and, and you just start looking for codes and finding codes, right? It, that We're going to build to that, okay? So very first search topic issue that I want to um, explore with you guys is the resurrection of Yeshua and the evidence that surrounds that. And that would include the Shroud of Turin. And so um, I think it will be a profound and edifying uh, experience for you guys in, in learning um how to search and so that's what we're going to be doing here at, you know at some point when when we get to uh everybody's on the same page with the download and so with that let's transition to to that point you guys i know many of you have been working on getting the downloads together some of you have done it successfully some of you are having issues and so uh we want it we don't you know we want to cross that bridge right now and so um let's do that now and uh, see where we are. Um, I want to get a count of who who has successfully got a code program and, and is ready to go, and and those that are you know having some trouble and need help in um, downloading. So uh, let me open the floor now for for any anybody who wants to to uh, voice uh, what's going on, and let's let's talk about that. Let's let's cross that bridge and see where we are. How we are? How we, how we doing, you guys? For those of you that are here, there's only 16 of you here right now. Um, but with those that are here, where are you on that? Does anybody, uh, you know, have any issues that any of you talk about? Maria is saying she's ready. Are you telling me you're ready because you got it downloaded and, and uh, everything is good? Very good. I'm so pleased to hear that. Uh, you know, some of you are having an easier time. Some of you are having a, a few issues, and and with the issues that are going on, I suspect it's got something to do with like, um, you know, virus uh, protection and things like that, or or some kind of, um, you know, software that you have that is keeping your your uh, computer safe and doesn't want to to download anything that's iffy. And again, this is older software. Uh, I did just saw somebody text. Margie is saying she has code finder and keys that work. Um, okay, we'll work on that, Margie. 
no worries. As long as you've got a viable one that, that's working, we'll teach you how to use it and, and um, it'll be fine. Uh, the fact that you're only able to, to do the Greek right now, I suspect with Code Finder, is because you've got to choose the text. You've got to choose the text that you're using. I think it's set already at Greek um, from the initial. <laughs> so uh, I think you're fine uh, with the Code Finder at least. Um, I'd like for everyone to have code finder and Taurus off, but if that doesn't happen, that's, that's fine. We'll work with what we have. Okay. So, uh, if you only have Taurus off, you will not be able to search the new Testament, but if you got code finder, uh, you guys are going to be, um, you guys are going to be looking at stuff that nobody's ever seen before. And um, I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm, I'm a little envious about that because I don't even have Code Finder myself. I used to, um, but I favored Taurus off so much that I, I kind of stayed with that. It was more, you know, being more comfortable in my element there. Um, but Code Finder has got some things that we really want to look at. We want to see the Peshitta, and especially like with this Code's uh, topic. Um, the the burial and resurrection, uh, the crucifixion of Yeshua. So, if we're using Code Finder, what um, look in file do should we be in? Okay, yeah, so th that's gonna that's gonna depend on what we're looking for and where we want to look. Okay. And the thing about Code Finder is is it's so versatile that we can look at the Greek, we can look at the English. And uh, we can look at the Peshitta, we can look at, um, you know, the Tanakh. There's even control text in the Code Finder, like Gone in the Wind and, and Moby Dick. And so for you guys that are that are going to be proficient in Code Finder, it's going to be a little different than than those that are only proficient in the Torosov. Because Torosov is only the Old Testament, you guys. It's not, and it's not the Greek, okay? It, and it's strictly in Hebrew. That's the other thing. That's why, uh, why I'm saying the Taurus, the, the, the code finder is going to be a huge asset for us because it's untouched in some of the territory that we can search there, like the Peshitta. Um, even myself, I want to be able to transition over and, and be able to be proficient in that code program. So um, uh, it, it, the rabbis have not searched that um, extensively. They've only concerned about the, the first five books. So you guys are, um, I don't even think, Many of you, some of you may even realize how special you are that you're going to you're going to be like pioneers going across the United States back in the early days when nobody had been to those areas before. Right. Seeing things for the first time. No one, no one has ever seen before. Right. So. Um, that's what I like about Code Finder. It, it's got more material we can search um, the one that the, the Taurus off and, I, and I'm not. You know, I had the opportunity to learn Code Finder about maybe eight years ago, and I kind of just I've, I'm simplified. So, so I, I want to just stick with Taurus off. I should have learned it, um, but other past others passed me in that, and um, and and actually learned that program and the functions and stuff. And, and so I have to depend on those to teach me how to use it. But I, I'm very confident once I do, I'll, I'll be able to find codes but that particular program has got a lot of bells and whistles it is I, I, i've often referred to it as the, the ferrari of code programs it's very uh robust and it's it's a lot there so um i'm happy that you guys are able to get it and, and retain it um we do have the capabilities of, of learning that program and uh, being able to search that text there. And that's the important part, is to be able to see what's in that text. And um, the the search possibilities so, are well, in. Uh, Jonathan, if we, when we search the Peshitta, should we type it in Aramaic or Hebrew? Well, you know, the, 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 uh, the words are going to be very similar. And, um, it you know, from what my experience, your search results don't have to be in Aramaic because it will find, um, you know, modern Hebrew words in there. But we do want to know the Aramaic terms. And so that that's something we kind of want to keep in mind. But for the most part, we're going to be able to find what we're looking for in the modern Hebrew because it's though that is so closely related. The the modern Hebrew and, and um, 
the the biblical the aramaic the, the language that yeshua spoke and i know some of you may be kind of confused what's the difference um, if i could give you one word and show you uh, for every aramaic word and let's just talk about heaven heaven shamaya shamaya in in the aramaic in the modern hebrew would be shamayim can you see that there's a root there so for every mm -hmm. hebrew word that's in aramaic the modern Hebrew is going to have a very close similar, similar word. You're going to see the root in there. Okay. So it's not going to be hard to make a transition between those two. Okay. Is that, is that, okay. Yeah. It yeah. Will... I think, yeah. Right now, everything seems kind of impossible for me, honestly. No, I, I get that. <laughs> but I'm trusting you that step by step, I'll get there. So, so, and we don't all have the Peshitta, I guess. You, you can buy it from the code finder site. It's $4.50. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So you could just add on, do an add on. Yeah. That's yeah, right. it downloads oh. something oh. that you install and it has the code finder. Yeah, it's like, like $5. Like, it's like, like $5 did, for that text. Yeah. Like, like it, it did the original program I bought that I couldn't install and you had to send me your Sita. Yeah. Yeah. You know that I had that problem to Gina, but that was because of the browser. When I changed my browser for the Peshitta, it would not download. So I changed it to Microsoft Edge and it did. So it's just trial and error, you know. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, that is good to know. I, I we, need to, we need to know all those little details because, you know, this this stuff is kind of finicky and, and um, you know, Knowing those details are very beneficial. I want to know, Michael, did you see my note and did you try that? Michael's on the call. He's muted. Is Michael here? How do you raise your hand? Is he here? Let me see. Yes, but I don't know if he's. Uh, I don't see Michael. Under participants, I'm seeing him. Michael? He's muted. Michael McNair. Oh, Michael McNair. McNair. Right. Yeah. Isn't that the Michael that, that asked me the question, I think? Michael, did you ask mm -hmm. Ethel a question about downloads, brother? You don't have to answer in the, in the um, you can answer in text if you like. Oh, yeah. He said he is. Uh, oh, he's yeah, doing I understand. Something. Okay, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know afterwards whether that works. I have a question. Absolutely. I was just wondering. I don't really know which way to jump, but I have a. I wrote in the chat that I have, uh, like it's called, an idea pad Lenova, and it's my my daughter is letting me use it because, um my other laptop doesn't work anymore i mean i can't even i can't even use and i had three different programs on there and my favorite was the code finder but i just want to get something on this one yeah and i don't even know if i can restore that one i think if i took it to the shop i think you, you would just say why can it, you know, because the, and I don't wanna... the lenovo the lenovo idpad is just like a windows pc so you can yeah. download it um and so do we have to are we we have to buy it over again or what? Which one? Which program? Did you buy it last time? The millennia? Yeah, it's been, it's been, I can't even access that computer. It's been a year. Okay. Now. So yes, you will have to buy it again for your new computer or you can, we can try to download the Taurus off. Yeah. Okay. I don't know which one to, to do. And I just was like, Hoping to do something sooner rather than later. We'll we'll we'll, we'll work on on getting to you, Mich uh, Michelle. Um, okay. Yeah, if you want co code finder, you're probably gonna have to buy that again. We can try okay. to do Torosoft and um and see where it goes. Okay. Thank All you. right. Any more questions, you guys? No questions um, or anything like that. Okay, so anybody else that's having issues with downloads, we'll, we'll try to continue to work on that this week. 
Uh, this past week has been really busy and then with the solar storm and the storm I'm having here locally, um, we, we couldn't do a, a another um, Zoom um, during the week. I just couldn't get to it, you guys. But uh, if we if we need to, I'll, I'll try to make arrangements this week and uh, meet with anybody that needs help in uh, getting their downloads together. Okay, Margie, I'll try to make sure that's posted over and um, Discord. Just uh, I, I thought I posted last week's class, but maybe maybe I missed doing that. Uh, but I'll try to get that up for you, and so you'll have it. All right, you guys, we're going to go back to normal um, class meeting on Friday. This next Friday coming up, we'll, we'll be at the regular time. Um, Again, we, we rescheduled for today because of the storms, and uh, we'll be back to regular schedule this week. So with that, let me just pray for us. We'll we'll see you guys in the next meeting, and uh, shalom to you, all right? I'm a Yehud. We're just so thankful for this group of students that you've sent to us, Father, and we, we pray that you just continue to uh, inspire them, to keep them safe, Father, that you would uh, open your word to them, in a mighty way that you would uh, go with them this week and bring them back at the appointed time. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, you guys. We'll, Thank we'll you. see you Friday. Good Message time. me if you need any help. Uh, if you need us to meet with you and try to help you out with the downloads, just let me know. All right. Shalom to you.